our next lesson, we're going to quickly comment on some of those uh, gases that are contributors to the air pollution. Specifically, we'll comment on carbon monoxide, uh, ozone, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen dioxide, and then what we call particulate matter, those solid um, pieces that are uh, lofting in the air. And we'll just take a turn for each of those one at a time. When we consider air pollution, each one of those gases uh, we mentioned is uh, contributing to the overall air quality, and it's actually measured on something known as an air quality index. One of the uh, pollutants we'll look at in our chapter is carbon monoxide, CO. And so here we see carbon monoxide. Here that prefix is we're learning our nomenclature. One carbon and one oxygen in its molecular formula. And just kind of showing you its Lewis dot structure, kind of looking at it in terms of its molecular structure. We see that there's a triple bond holding this molecule together, and these are electron pairs. This is just kind of showing what the, the molecular structure structure looks like. Now carbon monoxide, we have detectors typically um, throughout our home to be sure that uh, we have none coming from our furnace, for example, because it is known as a silent killer. It is a colorless, tasteless, and no smell to it at all. You don't even know it's seeping from the combustion of a uh, fossil fuel. If it's inhaled, it passes into your bloodstream and it interferes with the ability of your hemoglobin to carry oxygen. Hemoglobin is a molecule in your red blood cells, and in the red blood cell, oops, let me get rid of that message for us, thank you. <laughs> and in our red blood cells, we have, um, you know, the capacity to there, I've got this working now. In our red blood cells, I apologize, we have a, a molecule known as hemoglobin, and what it does is asphyxiate oxygen to deliver to our cells for cellular respiration. Molecular oxygen delivered to our uh, body cells is a good thing because we understand it's how it's, uh, oxygen is necessary to release energy through that process of cellular respiration. But hemoglobin has a greater affinity for this carbon monoxide molecule, and that just simply means the hemoglobin would rather attach to the carbon monoxide than the oxygen. So in its presence, our blood becomes saturated with carbon monoxide, and there's, there's really such a strong affinity between hemoglobin and carbon monoxide, it doesn't let it go. And therefore, even if you go out into fresh oxygen and start breathing again, it takes a long time to convince the carbon monoxide to release from the hemoglobin. It is quite a deadly gas. You start to feel dizzy, nauseous, start to develop a headache. And if you're sleeping and you have carbon monoxide being released into your home, you don't even realize it. You sometimes just don't wake up. And those are such tragic stories that we hear sometimes in the news. So where does it come from? It comes from the incomplete combustion of fossil fuels. Incomplete combustion means that what happens is that because the fuel to oxygen ratio is not quite mixed correctly. We take a fuel such as, well let's just say natural gas, something that we might burn in our homes uh, to release energy and fuel, heat. Out comes carbon monoxide and water vapor. When we have a an inappropriate fuel mixture between the oxygen and the fuel that we're burning. So this is called methane or natural gas. If we balance this equation we could see that we would need two to balance the hydrogens, one carbon, and what do we got going for oxygens? We have one two, three oxygens over here. So we'd have to balance either with a fraction or we know that the trick here to balance these combustions is to double to get rid of this odd number problem. So we have a, let's double what we know so far just to make our numbers whole. And now we can see that we have six oxygens total and we would end up using a coefficient of three. So a two to three to two to four ratio balances this equation. And what we're referring to here with incomplete combustion, instead of forming carbon dioxide, the fuel ratio to the oxygen available isn't mixed correctly. The fuel isn't burning cleanly, and this actually is another 
side effect. You start to see a lot of black soot, some uh, actual carbon ash developing on, uh, on the engines and so forth that are burning. My lawnmower does this all the time. When you start it up and you get all kinds of smoke and choking coming out, it's carbon monoxide gas that's coming out. And this is the silent killer. Extremely, extremely poisonous. Any type of uh, fuel source that is just not burning cleanly in an incomplete combustion. Another molecule is called ozone. Now ozone up high is really great for the environment because it's absorbing the ultraviolet uh, radiation coming from the sun. But ozone down low is no good. So ozone is an, a form of oxygen in which we start to see three molecules of oxygen bonded together. Now remember molecular oxygen found in its elemental form is just O2. So when you breathe in, that's oxygen. O2, it's diatomic molecular form, two atoms of oxygen bonded together. And O double bond O is its Lewis dot structure, what it looks like in terms of a, a molecular structure. But ozone has three oxygens bonded together. And we'll soon, we have a lot of uh, ozone topics in our future chapters as well. We'll understand that it exhibits resonance. In other words, there's more than one correct structure when I draw this ozone, but three atoms attached together. Now, they really talk about a sharp odor if you detect ozone nearby. Sometimes people will say it smells like um, bromine or an overchlorinated pool. Um, you might smell it near electric motors or welding equipment. It reduces lung function because again the oxygen in, that we prefer to breathe in for cellular respiration is being replaced with this ozone. So it's decreasing the lung capacity to bring in fresh air. And you start to feel pain in your chest. You might start sneezing, feeling lung congestion. So down low it's a pollutant. Up high it's a shield that prevents UV radiation from uh, causing cancer for skin cancer and so forth. A next gas considered a pollutant in the air is called sulfur dioxide, SO2. It also has a sharp, unpleasant odor. Now sulfur has a distinct odor such as um, like a stink bomb, that real sharp rotten egg smell. It dissolves in moist tissues in your lung to form an acid. So kind of a, again, sulfur dioxide when dissolved into water forms an acid and it goes on to form either sulfurous acid, H2SO3, or could then combine again with another oxygen and form sulfuric acid, a very strong acid commonly called uh, battery acid. So of course that would feel strong and pungent in your lungs as it just starts to develop an, uh, into an acidic nature. The most common source is burning coal. So you'll, you'll start to see a, a cloud of nitrous oxides and sulfur dioxides near power plants where they're burning coal. You have acute respiratory distress, heart failure, and asphyxiation at extreme conditions. So the WHO, the World Health Organization, actually considers sulfur oxides to be the worst pollutants we produce daily. And the number one source of this pollutant is coming from our coal burning power plants. Nitrous dioxide, NO2, has this characteristic brown color. It combines with moist tissues to produce an acid as well. So again, taking a look at the NO2 molecule dissolving into water forming an acid and this would be called nitric acid HNO3 nitric as an H uh, a very strong strong acid so again all of these pollutants contribute to things such as acid rain and ocean acidification uh, a lot of decomposition of our calcium carbonates um, such as uh, coral reefs and so forth in the oceans and any kind of um, shell bearing marine life is affected directly by this acid rain because the acid starts to decalcify their shells. So formed in the air from anything that is hot 
including vehicle engines and definitely the coal-fired power plants again. But even running our car contributes to nitrogen dioxide being released because it will, you know, there's molecular nitrogen in the air and when you heat that up you start to see a reaction between the oxygen and nitrogen forming the pollutant NO2. What we refer to as particulate matter is actually a, a really complex mixture of very tiny solid particles that are microscopic droplets. So they're suspended in the air. They're pretty least understood of all of the, the, um, the what we've been talking about is the pollutants in, their, uh, in the air, but they're classified by size rather than composition. So uh, particulate matter with a subscript of 10 is anything that averages about 10 micrometers. Remember a micro is 10 to the negative sixth meters, pretty small. And PM 2.5 are a little bit larger, some 2.5 micrometers. And so depending upon the size, you can see that the damage they have um, the, capa the uh, capability of doing, the smaller that particulate matter, the easier it gets lodged in our lungs and starts to wreak havoc in our uh, lung tissue. So particulate matter is more deadlier the tinier it becomes simply because the tinier it is the easier it is to get lodged in our bodies. It's easier to make it through um, the respiratory channel even through you know such as large particles might be um, you know stopped right at the nose where we have nose hairs acting as a protection. If they make it through the lungs and so forth the tinier it is the easier it can make it all the way to the alveola of the lung. Originating from many sources, vehicles, coal burning power plants, wildfires, you know that the smoke out uh, west for specifics um, create all kinds of particulate matter, ashes floating in the air, and even blowing dust. Soot and smoke are also examples of this particulate matter. The tinier it becomes, the more dangerous. And another gas considered a pollutant is called radon. Now radon is an invisible radioactive atomic gas that results from the decay of radium which may be found in the rock formations beneath certain buildings certain materials themselves and again these lead to uh, cancer as any radioactive material would we often get our homes tested in certain parts of the country for radon. Um, we try to limit our exposure to this naturally occurring radioactive gas just to be sure we're not living on top of a radon deposit. Whoops, that went too fast. I wanted to back up the screen. A moment of patience while we kind of work through this. Thank you. Oh, come on now. Take a pause with me. We'll get this program working. We're looking at air pollutants and risk assessment, and I just wanted to back up the screen with a sapling question and just take a consideration. Here it is. Thank you for waiting for me. Which of the following gases below are primarily obtained from the atmosphere? And what we've learned is nitrogen, oxygen, and argon are the most abundant naturally occurring gases in our atmosphere. Nitrogen, of course, is the most abundant, considered the solvent in our homogeneous mixture. Oxygen, another would be carbon dioxide, but I don't see it even as a choice here in our sampling question. And of course, argon. Nitrogen and oxygen by far the most. These are known as trace gases, but we do not find any uh, significant amount of hydrogen, helium, or chlorine. And I just want to be sure I shared that sapling example with you. And we'll kind of bring closure to these thoughts about air pollutants by talking about risk assessment, or se uh, third section in our chapter. You know, risk is a natural part of living, but we do try to minimize it. Would you rather drive in a car or fly in an airplane? It's all about perception. Statistically, we understand flying in an airplane is far safer than driving in a car based on crash data, based on the number of accidents. But our perception is we believe driving in a plane is more, more dangerous. The odds of dying from a vehicle are one in a million for each 30,000 miles traveled. But the odds of being involved in a plane crash, a fatality,
a fatal plane crash, one in 19.8 million. So risk assessment is all based on calculations and not perceptions, not pre these predictions. What, what do you feel is the more uh, risky behavior? And we use that as our definition of risk assessment from the EPA, the evaluation of scientific data to help us make predictions in an organized matter about the probabilities of an occurrence. Toxicity are intrinsic health hazards of a substance. You know, how much arsenic can we be exposed to? How much radon can we be exposed to? And exposure is the amount of substance we encounter. They consider, when, when deciding these risk assessments, how much should be allowed in the air before it's considered toxic and how long are we able to expose ourselves to it with a certain rate of breathing. So all of these variables are taken into consideration with a risk assessment. The EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, which was formed in 1970, has been charged with the task of considering risk assessments. Is this a risky behavior? And here's a table pulled from our text, the U.S. National Ambient Air Quality Standards. How much of a certain poison or pollutant should we expose ourselves to before harm comes to our health? In carbon monoxide, remember the silent killer, CO? For an eight hour average, you should be exposed to no more than nine parts per million. For an hour, no more than 35 parts per million. Nitrogen dioxide, you can see all as we look down, ozone, particulates, and notice that the particulates become increasingly more dangerous the longer you're exposed to them. And the size of that particle, if it becomes increasingly smaller, it becomes more dangerous. So these are set forth by the EPA and approximately equivalent concentrations is a microgram per cubic meter, which is just the uh, air quality uh, and its assignment. You can see that it's, you know, the longer you're exposed to a particular pollutant, the more dangerous it becomes. This is a practice problem, just kind of a thought problem uh, placed for us in our text. Suppose you collect an air sample on a city street. The analysis shows that it contains 5,000 micrograms, which was that little squiggly U, a microgram of carbon monoxide per cubic meter of air. Is this concentration harmful to breathe? And so what it's really having us do is just go back and check. Remember how we're allowed for an average uh, eight hour period, 10,000, but a, uh, just a one hour, 40,000 micrograms per cubic meter meter and so you can see that that's less than either one of those standards and so it is not reaching a toxic level. But this brings up our kind of our next lesson on what might be a better way to represent these numbers. We have 10,000, 40,000, 5,000 and it brings us to our lesson on what's called scientific notation. And at this point, you're going to pause this lesson and go into the next video lesson and learn all about how scientists write out such very, very, very large numbers or very, very, very tiny numbers using scientific notation. So pause the lesson here and go on to your next scientific notation lesson.